Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, I think it's important to say the pledge, and I, I, I think sometimes when people say, say the pledge to quiet people down, um, you know, what you're here doing tonight is really the most American of American traditions. Becoming informed so you can vote. And, um, you know, the hope is we're videotaping it. People will be able to view it at home. We have a, a, a stuff up on the website. And we've been encouraging everybody who comes to, the, to a forum or comes to a tour to ask a neighbor to do the same thing or, you know, show their neighbors how to go online and to actually see um, the conditions of the schools so they can make an informed decision. Because I'm very proud of the fact, that I'm, I'm proud of the administrative team here, and we know on May 16th, we're gonna work just as hard no matter what the decision is by this community. You know, we work for the East Dyson community, you're gonna decide what you want for these schools. You know, tonight we're very fortunate, we have Mrs. Christine Crowley here from Financial Advisor, Fiscal Advisors, and Mr. Robert Wilmoth from H2M, the architects, and they're gonna make two presentations. But I would ask if you'd indulge me. Because without this woman, this district would not run. And it's Joanne Mann's 21st birthday. So could we sing happy birthday to her, please? <laughs> Wait, she just became a grandmother for the first time. And she's very excited to go celebrate. For the, she's going to celebrate her birthday with her granddaughter tomorrow. But her granddaughter is three weeks old. So could, let's just sing a nice happy birthday to Joanne Mann. <laughs> happy birthday to you. And we'll get into detail on these as well. 
Um, so the next slide that you already have is in Topeka. Um, so the first one I want to cover is talk about the retiring debt. And this can be um, maybe one of the more confusing pieces of it, so please don't hesitate to ask questions. I'll try to lay it out it's very simple so you can see from left to right exactly what you're looking at. So existing debt building aid and local share. So this is what the district currently has outstanding in bonded debt, what they expect to receive in building aid, and like I mentioned before, what is that tax levy associated with that? So in this chart, we have the fiscal year, that total debt service, which is the principal and interest on the debt, your estimated building aid, again, the revenue coming in, and then the tax levy is the difference. And you can see between 2021 and 21, 22, I have a red box around those two lines. And you can see debt service is dropping from 5.6 million to 600,000. That's because there's debt that's outstanding that will be maturing and no more payments will be due on those. Similar to your mortgage, once you make your final payment, you're free and clear. Um, and then the estimated building aid, you can see that that goes from 3.7 down to 2.6 million. Not quite as much of a drop. So then if we go to the local share where taxes are being levied, in 2021 you can see it's about 1.9 million. And then in 21-22, it goes down to about a negative 2 million. So there's a pretty large drop there in what tax levy is required from one year to the next. And districts use that as an opportunity to say, okay, we have capital needs that must be addressed. Instead of waiting a few years and having that tax levy, go away or be appropriated to different areas, can we put it to a new project to assess the needs that we have, capital needs? And so that's that's one of the tools that we look at when we're doing our um, financing plan. So then the capital reserve, as I mentioned, it's, it's a savings account, if you will, to help offset local share. And what a capital reserve does is you take those funds, you spend those funds on capital projects, you don't borrow that amount. So in this instance, instead of 59 million, you'd be borrowing only 57 million. And then the building aid still comes in on that amount. So that's what helps. It's a, it's a way to reduce your borrowing um, and still have the same revenue coming in, similar to a down payment on your mortgage is what it comes down to. Um, the building aid eligibility of a project, that's something that we really want to focus on and make sure we are uh, maximizing to the district's best interest. So um, the state looks at the project scope and they say they have different criteria that has to be met. Certain scope is aidable, certain scope is not aidable. They impose what's called a maximum cost allowance. So they look at each building and they say, as an example, um, the high school, and I'm making numbers up at this point for an example, but um, they'll say, okay, we'll give you $10 million of maximum cost allowance. You can spend 15, but 10 million is what we'll aid you on. So that's what the maximum cost allowances are. So it's important for us to know those so that we can tell you whether you're going to be over max cost allowances or not so you can shift your scope as, might, as you might like to. Um, so at this point, we're assuming 88.9% of the $59 million project would be aidable. And that's based on reviewing those figures and reviewing the proposed scope for aidability. Um, then the building aid ratio, the state sets this and it's 70% for East Islip. So of those aidable expenses, the district will reimburse 70 cents of every dollar that is spent. Um, another piece that's important when we're looking at building aid is the term the building aid payment will be paid over, and that's important. We wanna make sure that your debt matches those aid payments. So because this project is mostly reconstruction, it would be 15 years as assigned by the State Education Department, so that's the, um, the same debt term that we would work with. Um, timeline of project is very important because the state, again, building aid, um, the state will not start building aid payments until, until certain criteria are met, so we wanna know what those timelines are so that we can make sure that when the district is doing the borrowing, there will be that aid to offset those payments. Um, so here we have when we built the financing plan, <clears throat> we broke it into two phases, phase one and phase two. Now, the district is asking, the Board of Education is asking for a vote on 
um, the full both phases at one time. It's just the construction that's phased in. So just as you're looking at that, that's why you'll see different construction dates and different final cost report and certificate of substantial completion dates. And those um, forms, final cost reports, and certificate of substantial completion, that's part of what's required by SED in order for that aid to begin. Um, we also want to look at interest rates. That's a big piece of it. Same thing when you're going out to borrow a mortgage. Um, you want to know where rates are, where you expect rates to be, and you want to put those into the financing plan. Um, and then your state assumed rate, when the state calculates their building aid payments, and they amortize over 15 years, they're recognizing that you're making you, they're making you um, receive those payments over 15 years, so they do include an interest rate component. So we want to know what we expect that to be as well, because that impacts the building aid payment. And I apologize. I should have moved it along. I hope everyone has copies of them. My apologies. So when we take all of that information, all those variables, we sit down and we analyze it, and we put it into a financing plan. It comes up with that phase one we looked at at the prior page can be about 10.5 million. And then phase two can be the difference of 49.4 million. So how does that fit into what we were looking at earlier? And does everyone have one of these in front of them? Because it is really hard to read these numbers up on the screen for this particular page. Does anybody not have it with a wiper copy? Thank you. Okay. So this is push putting everything together. And that's why this is an important page. I want to make sure everybody can actually see um, because those, there's a lot of numbers on the screen up there. So one of the first couple slides I talked about the retired debt and local share. So I wanted to show everyone what it looks like when we put everything together. So again, we have our fiscal year. We have our estimated local share for existing debt. Those are the numbers we talked about a few slides ago. Then the voters approved an energy performance contract last April. So we wanted to take that into account because that's debt that will be incurred as well. You want to make sure you're looking at everything. Um, and with the EPC on the note at the bottom, we have not assumed applying any of the energy savings to these figures. So this is a very conservative approach with respect to the EPC. Um, then we're showing the $10.5 million phase one and the $49.5 million phase two. And then if you look at the column that says grand total estimated local share, you'll see I have four red arrows. And you can see in 2021, our base year, if you will, we're at million. And then if you go down the column, it's substantially the same. So that's how that project, the um, proposed project, is being layered in. And as your debt is retiring, we're taking that tax levy and applying it to the debt of the new project. And I just stole my own thunder for the last couple of years. Um, so, Mr. Dolan, are we taking questions now, or are we doing the presentation and doing questions? How would you like to do that? I mean, I'm happy to entertain any questions if it's okay. I think if there's a question in mind, we can ask okay. you one of the same questions now. Okay. Does anyone have I'll any questions anyway. at this point? Okay, I, I believe some people are ready to sit down, so, yes, sir. Yeah, we, we made, um, and this was out the 2036. Yeah. Um, this is taking into consideration some state aid you were saying all that. Yeah. Um, you don't know what goes on from year to year. I didn't know how can you be so certain about all these numbers that you're talking about in 2036. So that's probably our most popular question that we get. <laughs> so the in order for the cap the um, formula for building aid to be changed, it would take a legislative change. So it would, the law would actually have to be changed. Um, we don't know that it won't change in the future. We, we don't know that. What we do know is what the state has done in the past, and they have changed that formula in the past. And when they, every time they have changed that formula, they've given amnesty, if you will, for debt that's already outstanding, or they've provided an avenue for the district to restructure their debt so that it better aligns with whatever their new building aid rules are. So again, we don't know what will happen in the future. We do know what they have done in the past, and we have to go with what we know today 
or we, nobody would be doing projects across the state, and a lot of need would be out there. I'm sorry, what's that, sir? They wouldn't be doing projects going out 20 some odd years. Yes, they are. And, even, and it's because of the way the state building is paid. So if you, let's, let's put it another way. If you were to do a brand new building, let's say that you were to say, you know what, let's sell a high school and let's build a brand new high school, different location, better ball fields, however you want to say it. If you were to do that type of a project because it'd be new construction, the state would make the building and payments over 30 years. So instead of the 15 years for reconstruction, we make it 30 years. And one other one other thing, since you're looking at the numbers just to maybe help get your mind around the, the term of the debt. So the state would so you if the, the voters are gonna vote on a fifty nine point nine million dollar project, within that project there's if it should be approved, there'll be project numbers by building and by phase. So you could easily end up with maybe 15, 20 different project numbers. Each of those project numbers has its own aid flow. So the aid flow for the project would be part of phase one, that aid would start first, and so would the borrowings. And then phase two, maybe part of the, um, the some of the project numbers for that, maybe they're broken up into two, two different pieces, so maybe we'd have two different aid flows for the phase two. And so we mimic the debt to that, so that's why it might look like it's going out longer than 15 years. Okay. Any other questions right now? Yes, sir. Um, I was wondering, are we allowed to use surpluses from future years to help buy down the bond debt? Yes. So if the board chooses and there's a surplus at the end of the fiscal year and the um, debt is still in short term financing, which means bond anticipation notes, so one year obligation. If you're still in that one year obligation, you can use, let's say you have a $200,000 surplus. Um, and let's say you've budgeted $800,000 for a principal reduction. You could ask the board for permission, for yourself, for permission to um, use the $200,000 of unappropriated fund balance to pay to make an additional payment on that bond anticipation note. So you budgeted $800,000, you have $200,000 surplus, you can make a million dollar principal reduction against that obligation. Once you're in long term bonding, you cannot do that anymore. Yes, sir. How many years do we expect to make the 57, 50, 60 million dollars? How many projects are in and how long do you take to expend that amount? Less bond, it took yep. 10 years to spend. How many years do you think it's going to take you to spend 60 million dollars? So right now we're looking at two phases. And so in the slides we had when we showed construction, I believe it was construction in 19 and construction in 20. It may go to summer of 21, depending on how the work can be accomplished um, without impacting the students. So, and, and I will defer a little bit to Robert from H2M on that. Would you say three summers from starting in 19? So in other words, over a three year period, to disperse with $60 million. Say the state gives you in the year, third year, we have a surplus fund of two, three million dollars. We don't spend that money on a capital project because we didn't technically borrow it yet. So the third year, we take our own money and disperse that and never borrow that money of the 60 million. That can be done as well. And by surplus, you're meaning unappropriated fund balance. Unappropriated funds, balance, that's correct. Um, so then you can do that and pay off and then never borrow money in the first place. Well, and we'll go forward. It, you, you could do that. However, let's think a little bit about the process. And it's a process that unfortunately none of us are in control of. It's something the state dictates and then we work around it to make it the best scenario. Well, I'll give you an so, example. Here's a simple example. We went $85 million 20 years ago. Yeah. Student populace, this, you said this up. Student populace at that time was 3,800 kids. Teaching staff at that time was say 300. Okay. 20 years period of time, we lowered the amount of teachers by probably 15%. Okay. Student population came down 20%. And here we are at $115 million budget. Okay. Sometimes the numbers don't get. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Well, one thing's coming down, the other one's going up. Thank God we have a board in place now that really is actually thinking of the community and the future of where repairs are here. Far too long, 
they like the accolades of people saying thank you, did a great job. There's both been taking on our chin and now we're replaced. So I like the idea of what they're doing. I don't care where they spend all the money, I think. I think some of the money should be spent on other areas that the kids really need. But that's this their choice, this is their board, and I'll support their decision. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. So looking at this, I'm kind of new to this, I'm a new homeowner. Sure. What's the impact of me and my red and all my neighbors in a worst case scenario in a tax situation? So I pay twelve thousand dollars a year now. Five years from now, I have two kids in the district. Am I going to be paying 20? Because I can't afford to pay 20. <laughs> I didn't want to pay 12. Neither can I. Can I, can I. <laughs> <laughs> well, I paid 12 because of the district. Absolutely. So, there's two different sides to the budget. I can speak to the capital side. Okay. The district will have to speak to the operating side. Um, there are certain mandated costs, contractual costs, that, that do impact the operating side. Um, from the capital side, as, as long as the district stays on um, track for the project that has been planned. And, you know, this is pre-referendum. We go on, if the referendum is approved, a whole other set of uh, plans go into, the design goes into real um, definitive um, pieces and so on. So, oh, exactly, so we're gonna continue, but we're gonna continue to look at all of that and make sure the district is aware of it, if anything, who's out of line with where we are for the financing plan. And I'm saying that because I don't want you to think that once the voter approval is done, everything's set to be. But if we can stick with that plan and we can keep everything in line, which is done all the time across over 700 districts in the state, um, the taxes that you are levied in 1920 for capital purposes, assuming the district doesn't take on any additional capital projects after the 50 million, 59 million would be approved, then your taxes for the capital purpose will remain level with your 1920 um, level. So there wouldn't yep. be a spike. Not, not for the capital reason. No. Unfortunately, this and morning on New Slow, we put it on, and the people who live in Long Beach, their taxes just went up by 10%. Yeah. And they don't have a thing to do about it. Yeah. I'm not saying that that would happen here, and it's not right. being that very well versed in knowledge in how this package right. works, right? I do know what I paid when I moved in, and I do know what I pay now. I kind of keep an eye on that, though. Yep. I just come to, uh, I'm expecting it to increase every year. Yeah. <laughs> Different district, but I expect to say increase with those Yes. <laughs> but um, no, that's, the district has a, a nice opportunity in the fact that um, you have the debt that is expiring, and there's already a tax levy built into it to the taxes that can be applied to address those needs. Not every district has that. Some districts don't have um, debt, you know, that will be expiring for another 10 years, so they don't have that job and that tax um, to take and apply to it. So. Thank you. I appreciate that. I don't work with Long Beach, so I'm not sure, but <laughs> yes, sir. I have a question about the uh, percent that you might have to pay for the loan. Okay. We don't know what it is. No. Now, is it, how does that affect the numbers that we're looking at now? Okay. So we have been conservative in our numbers um, as far as interest rates, and interest rates are starting to increase. What the state does is, we talked earlier about the state assumed interest rate that's part of the building aid payment calculation. So the state says, okay, we're going to pay building aid based on the state assumed interest rate if you go out and if you issue bonds on your own. So then, let's say it's, um, well right now it is, the state assumed interest rate is 2%. And let's say you can go out and issue on your own for 3%. The difference between the interest the state is reimbursing you and the interest you're paying is 1%, that difference between 2 and 3. So let's say now we're a few years down the road, we're ready to convert to serial bonds. And now let's say that state assumed rate is 2 and a quarter percent because rates have started to increase and the state is always a little behind on that. Um, so let's say that you know rates have started to increase, so your state assumed rate, your building payments are now calculated on 2 and a quarter percent. But let's say now it's going to it's going to um, be three and a half percent for you to borrow. So we say, okay, now we're at 1.25 percent difference. So now we say, okay, let's do. The state has this program set up through Dormitory Authority, New York State Dormitory Authority, we call it DASNY, and they say if you issue as a pool district with our DASNY pool, where a whole bunch of school districts issue that together. We will now calculate your borrowing rate based on your actual DASNY borrowing rate. So 
let's say that you're borrowing through DASNY at 3.5% because DASNY typically is a little bit higher interest rate, but now you're being reimbursed at say 3 or 3 and a quarter percent. And I'm not saying 3.5 because they're going to blend in any of your bond anticipation note rates in there too. So that short, that reduces the spread um, and increases your building aid payments for where you're paying that. And if you look at that continual, you know, as long as your building aid payment follows you along, then you should have where you can um, make it tax neutral. And as a, as a side note, right now we have 1% difference between the state assumed rate and the assumed bonding rate, and that's very conservative. We typically see closer to half a percentage at most. So that helps to add a little conservatism into the numbers. Thank you. You're welcome. I know that's a lot of high-level mumbo jumbo, so if anybody wants me to go back over that again, I'd be happy to. Okay. Yes, sir. I have a question. For all I know, you will be able to do mumbo jumbo. I'm sorry. I tried to. No, I didn't I'm not trying to follow it, but that's okay. You're very good. The bond is 50, 59 bucks. Now, what is the amount that will be paid back after however many years it takes to pay it back? In other words, if I borrow 100,000 for 30 years, I'm going to be paid back 400,000. So yep. What is the actual amount? So our, oh, I didn't put the total on there. I don't know if I have that figure. Bear with me one quick second. I don't know if I have that exact. I don't have my columns totaled, so I can get that number for you. Well, give us I was, a ballpark figure. How much interest did you pay over the 15 years? Well, we did it at a two. Uh, we did it at three percent. Twenty million. Fifteen million. Sure, somewhere around there. Somewhere around twenty million. So, yeah, so I would say that's interest. Right. It's interest. Interest, yes. So then the fifty dollars would be around seventy nine eighty. Total set service number is 29 million. Thank you. Uh, 29, 29 million, I know we can count it up a number. 29 million, 230,000, 281 dollars. Very good. Now is that, which page are you looking at? Is that a local share number? Right there. Okay, so that's what's currently yeah, existing. 29 and 59, so you've got about 30 million outstanding. Yeah, so that's what's outstanding right now. <laughs> You're asking for the interest on the proposed project, what we would expect to pay, is that correct? Yes. I will get that for you. I don't have it right here, and I apologize. Um, I might have it in my file, so when I sit down, I'll look and see if I do. I might even have it on a flash drive that I can pull up. I'm sure you have it. You have every faculty. <laughs> <laughs> but you stumped me. <laughs> that was not my intention. <laughs> Any other? Yes, ma'am. Can you explain how the capital reserve funds will offset? Or Absolutely. will it be used? Yes. So what happens is, um, so the total project is 59.9 million. So if you didn't have the capital reserve, the district would need to borrow 59.9 million, and then you'd be aided accordingly. Um, with the two million capital reserve, we only have to borrow 57.9. You're still aided on the 59.9, but you're only borrowing 57 million, so you're paying much less in interest over the 15-year term. So that's how that's applied. It's only a one-time fund? A one-time fund, correct. Um, if the district um, chose to go back to the voters prior to going to long-term financing, and they said, okay, we have um, you know, $500,000 in capital reserve, we want to apply it to this project, they would have to go out to another referendum and ask voter approval for that. Okay. Yes, sir? The 70% New York State building aid, yes. are you locked into that number, or can that drop to 65%? It's not a locked-in number. It can change from year to year. What was it when we did the last when we did the last uh, bond? It was much higher. Um, I, I don't have the number offhand, but I want to say it was high 80s, low 90s. Um, and the, the rationale there is there was a 
uh, merger incentive ratio that was given out. And Not the wild card. Yeah. Well, um, so the merger incentive was um, something they let go for a long time and probably should have sunsetted earlier than they did. Right now, the 70% is just the district on its own wealth. So there's no other factors being brought in there that could raise or increase it drastically. Um, it could drop, we typically don't see it drop more than one or two percentage points or raise more than one or two percentage points. Okay. Yes, sir. I believe 20 years ago it was 90%, 10 years ago it was 80%, and then he added it to the 70% that you don't get all that payback the following year. Now you make the payments over 50 years at 70%. So that, that's one of those changes. And, and now the only problem that I see from what I'm hearing, you know, like I said, I need to sue you fix it because this belongs to people, doesn't belong to anybody else. Okay. But the problem I see is borrowing money that may or may not be able to afford. We don't know that. That's not known. But the good thing that I know is that 20 years we'll be getting a little bit more aid from the state every time there's an election coming up. Now we all know the tax is running probably the president, call him, I mean, <laughs> uh, that we might see a surplus of funds coming in through that way. So we can take advantage of his generosity while he screws everybody else over. So that way we can have more money to spend. So hopefully this board doesn't give away the raises like the previous board did. Okay. It's belongs to us, yeah. not them. Sorry, Let's keep on the finances. It all relates to one can we start with the architect now? Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Christine. Thanks. Just a quick note, as, as before we turn it over to Robert to see the you know the conditions and the possibilities. Um, one of the things that I've learned on this journey is how hard it is to divorce yourself from your home finances your business finances, these are schools. And um, you know, I think we should applaud the East Lassen School District because we have not laid debt on top of debt on top of debt. What the state has is, a, is I think, a good system. There are over 700 school districts in the state. And what they're saying is every 15 years, fix your facilities. Every 15 years. Not every time you get a new superintendent that wants to do something, not every time the board changes, not every time there's a whim. But every 15 years, fix your roofs, fix your windows, fix your electric. Um, and as Robert's going to show you now, um, you know this bond is predominantly the roofs, the electric, the bathrooms, things that won't have to be fixed again for another 30 years. So we're already having conversations about the note we're going to leave, um, you know, under the under the lot of the desk to the next generation that says this is what we did in 2018. This is why we did it. Now it's 2033. Um, these are the things you need to look at because we, we did not address them because we didn't have to address them and we weren't going to break the backs of the community. Um, so I'm going to bring Robert Wilmot up from H2M Architects to show you what it looks like and what it could look like. On the cards, and then at the end, Mr. Carpenter, so I'm going to be able to collect them from everyone. And um, yeah, and, uh, you know, all of you three, not a trip. And if you have any questions, you will let me know. Thank you. 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 I don't like to take cards. Find out and prove how my right to it. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Rob Walker from HMM. Uh, it's 
probably has definitely had the harder part, I think, at the moment, um, trying to make it work. Uh, financially, what I'm here to do is to tell you, uh, as Mr. Dolan has said, what's the intent, what is the main uh, goal from this bond in terms of work scope? What are the improvements to my school that are, my kids are going to, or that's down the block? So, um, I'm just going to start off with saying that the state, not every 15 years, the state actually has in, it, in its guidelines to have each school district study and prepare reports on a comprehensive public safety program for their school district. It's written into the bylaws, it's part of the code, and by doing that as part of that plan, you have a uh, building condition survey, which is uh, updated every five years, it outlines all the components of your school district, goes into about 110 different components, uh, maps out the condition at that time, and tries to assess a value or a hierarchy of need of repair. And another way to then assess that is then creating a capital plan. What we're doing that. Uh, part of that plan uh, that SCD has come up with in turn covers every category. Toilets, site work, uh, interior upgrades, exterior upgrades, roofing repair, I still don't think this was my, sorry. Uh, all the way down to accessibility. So what we've done in our firm uh, is to go out with our architects and engineers surveying the buildings. We researched and backed up our findings with the current building condition survey that you've done maybe about three and a half years ago. Um, I do a 2015, and then meet with all the facility administrators, uh, talk to the district. We actually helped chair and fund a community-driven uh, facilities community group where we reviewed uh, the priorities of WorkScope and what you're just going to see tonight um, in terms of the typical photographs that we've selected are just a sampling of what is condition at each building, which we'll go through. Uh, uh, so what we've done is tried to create, along with uh, Ms. Crowley, is a sound financial plan, come up with a schedule of that work in that plan, and which builds not on replacing the school, but actually built off a majority of the existing conditions that you have, which are fairly good. Um, there are conditions of, say, roofing, toilets, that are things that are need to be done, yes, but overall, are your buildings crumbling down? No, they're not. So, move on. What we have found, the major scopes of work are the site work, building envelope, roofs, masonry, windows, doors, interior finishes, uh, the toilets, flooring in the corridors and or classrooms, uh, leaking conditions would obviously be replaced, plumbing fixtures, most of the toilets that you have are original to the buildings, uh, except for the building conditions that you just built about 10 years ago. Um, security vestibules, cafeteria, kitchen, and uh, locker room upgrades. Most of your uh, locker rooms haven't been upgraded in quite some time. Uh, and then the electrical building systems, HVAC uh, components, the building uh, air conditioning, ventilation systems, most of the electrical panels are in poor condition and are original to the building. So um, what I'd like to do is just go through quickly each school with a sampling or a smattering of photos. Um, to try to just give you a quick appearances on what you is currently there, I'm sure within the, what is it, 38 or so, or 35 that uh, visits that Mr. Dolan has uh, formulated, everybody's getting a good idea. Uh, the first left photo is the high school roof, say about three days after a rain, at which point the water is still pumped, the dirt is still collecting. 
you have about, uh, most of the buildings have three roofs all on top of each other currently. You have a 1950s to 60s to 70s roof, then with a urethane foam roof from the 80s, and then um, the 90s they put a rubber roof on top. That has created a lot of uh, unsettling conditions, meaning not unsettling as in, oh my gosh, but uh, valleys, ridges, dips. That are still collecting water on the roofs. Uh, security vestibules, uh, just a typical vestibule from high school, to the interior doors that are not ADA compliant. They're not the vestibules <coughs> currently not as secure as they can be. The district would like to improve those. A comprehensive security upgrade along with cameras, etc. Those improvements are being looked at. Uh, locker rooms, missing toilet fixtures, um, panels that are maxed out that cannot be added on to. So even if you did want to include air conditioning, you can't put any new electrical load on your buildings. Um, we looked at uh, the interior lobbies to see where they, they can be improved. Cafeterias over to the bottom of the left. Interior toilets, most of your in, in toilets, again, as, at the schools, are about 40 to 50 years old. Uh, most, especially at the high school, the tile has actually been painted over with an epoxy paint. So that is now trapping some water that's behind the tile and or it just is, never will get clean. So you're painting and constantly maintaining and spending money to maintain them and keep them clean. There are conditions at the exterior doors that are actually allowing water into your building, thereby damaging your buildings. So we're looked at those conditions and annotate those at high school. Most of these photos will become somewhat repetitive, so I'm just going to continue going faster. Middle school, as you can see at the upper left and right, uh, you're getting some growth in the lower left. Um, the little patches that you can see, if you can see this. Um, are just little patches of dirt. That's where all the water has been collecting, and it's actually dry. The water is dried off, leaving sediment on your roof, thereby creating the green vegetation that you're getting on top of them. There are cracking. There are cracks at the building corners and in around window heads. Uh, each, uh, I'd say, ventilation systems that are no longer used or just tarped and uh, duct taped over which is the upper right-hand side. Locker room facilities, the middle school, um, are over another decade at this point. Uh, they are in need of upgrade. The toilets, actually the urinals going down to the floor are against healthcare currently. So most of those uh, middle school rooms are actually at tile in and around that's popping up. Those need to get replaced. The fixtures, uh, need to, and the toilet needs to become into ADA compliance and become part of the new health code. Uh, you've got site work that's falling near the drains, the cracks, divots, that needs work. Electrical panels, interior floor tiles at the middle school. Even on the newer wings, the tiles are actually split, splitting apart, separating, creating more areas for water to get in and more future damage that you're going to have to repair. Kenny, same type of roofing system, and what the lighter areas you see between the two little uh, thick white caps that are coming out, those are vents, is more sediment that was about a week old now. That uh, there's so much water that you're actually getting mounds of dirt on top of your roof. Why is this a problem? Because it's going to eventually come in through the layers of the roof and then create more damage if it hasn't done so already. Duct work is starting to split apart at the edges. It's uh, about now 15, 18 years old and it's starting to fail. You're getting a lot of sediment and rust along the, uh, the middle photo is your metal roofs that you just installed or built in 2003 are starting to rust. All of the flashings, the middle points, the gutters are actually 
some of the schools are completely rotting through. Uh, again, more brick damage that you can see there on the lower right. It's interior ceiling tiles, say, in the cafeteria that are stained with ductwork that's above the roof is not insulated properly, it's starting to fail. Moisture is gaining inside the duct because of moist and warm air and it's coming down through your, your duct by your louvers and registers. Interior doors that have interior louvers at the lower left hand corner are uh, not currently code compliant anymore. Those would be then replaced and repaired and made more secure as part of this, our, our survey. Interiors are uh, were reviewed, casework was reviewed, uh, lighting conditions in the classrooms were reviewed, how classrooms were currently laid out were also reviewed. Most of that has been uh, in the whole process along with the community has been filtered out and adjusted accordingly to the numbers that you're seeing there. Uh, interior stairs, handrails don't go into compliance with current code. Your, any your uh, interior partition in the cafeteria is now um, framed and is in poor condition. Window sills, window glazing, uh, our frames on the uh, are starting to rust. The glazing is starting to turn. The uh, caulking is starting to fail. Moisture is coming down through the, what you can see is the dark areas underneath the window cells, letting moisture in, some of it escaping so that it's not creating mold and dirt. Set of deposits, more photos of the doors and panels, which are original. Again, Kennedy Clock, I'm going to continue cloning quickly because I'm not going to bore everybody here, but you're seeing more of the same. Ponding water. Now, this is, roof is being currently replaced. Currently now we're along the EPC, but we've included all of this in our survey work and actually has been reduced as part of the overall bond and taking into account the EPC work that is currently going on. Steel is rusting, interior glazing is um, starting to fail. Masonry cracks along the corners of the building at the lower and upper ends of the building. Interior toilets are in the same similar condition. Middle right hand corner, um, the lobby tile is starting to cup and split due to excessive water penetration. Interior doors don't have the necessary hardware, not secure with the right hardware and electrical panels again <coughs> at Kinetic Club. Kenny, I'm just going to keep on going a little bit faster now. Um, again, interior and exterior work. Rusting, it's all the same, similar conditions. Toilets, interior lobbies, uh, we've noticed asbestos tile that's on some of the classroom areas and uh, locker room areas that will be abated as part of the work. Timber point, as well as also exhibiting, you can actually see the rusting gutters that are down below and the roofing on the lower left hand corner. Timber Point has exterior drains along the outside. Those drains are getting clogged and are leaking because the flash is starting to fail. And we actually see columns of moist masonry coming all the way down the building, culminating, as you see over here, clean up the bottom where the whole entire area is moist and never gets dry. Masonry, when it never gets dry, is also going to crack, heave, and splinter apart. Interior photos, we have a lot of the classrooms, the smaller single-use toilets down in the center. Um, it's a good photograph. Most of Connecticut, um, some of the JFK, Kenny, Timber Point will have single-use toilets. Those are going to be um, dealt with. They're not EDA compliant. There are needs that each lower grade will need a specific toilet that's close by. Those will get renovated and upgrade as part of the work scope. So again, excessive amounts of glazing on the border doors and interior hardware that is not code compliant and not secure. As part of the bond, we also looked at uh, your district facilities. Uh, 
JFK has a shed out in the side yard. You, by, behind the uh, Kenny and the high school, you have a facility building that has, at one point, it had three bays. It's now down to two because they just can't use certain sections of the building. They've stripped off old and damaged materials. Most of the building cannot be used. The exterior cladding is failing, the roofing is failing, and the electrical system is needed upgrade. What we've now outlined is all of the work still we processed that. We've taken out the energy compliance work, current work that we currently have, and formulated it into rough costs by each school, culminating in a $59.9 million work still. Again, as Carly said, where this, does the money come from? The CIP work comes through bonding, capital line items can be made for each component, say, all right, I only want to do roofing, then you can vote each component for work scope. We're now collecting everything together, agreeing to a certain work scope, coming up to a 59.9 million dollar. Next is the, the plus side, what for that 59.99 will it look like? Well, the line share of the money is in, um, at least really our numbers are, we've got about 15 to 20 percent are just roof costs. So I can't really show you a nice pretty photo of what a new flat roof is going to look like, but I'm going to share with you that we are going to be putting in replacement of most of the metal roofing. Since it's currently failing, we can now dress up the facade on at least at the high school, fix the trim around the roof areas to match, uh, make the entrances more uh, desirable, and start putting more curb appeal in the exterior plantings, and sprucing up most of the metal roofing that we have on the district. For the schools. It's part of the work scope, and um, if people can see online, if there are the components of the exterior. We're not just doing solely exterior work, uh, system upgrades, but we are doing certain components of uh, the educational part, including repairs to some of the rooms for STEM. We are also including in the high school music suite and at the middle school some music suite renovations. What you're seeing here, we're actually consolidating and re-adjusting the layout of the music suite so we can get the third classroom in that's desired by the school administrator. Just a simple uh, image of what the public toilets could look like, not necessarily what they will eventually look like, but just a representation that we can play with the colors and make them a lot more brighter and, and better places to be in. What we do have as part of the main campus is some exterior uh, site work as part of the bond, where we are working on the middle school, high school, and uh, the fields next to the ECC, and upgrading those and providing turf fields and replacing the track at the middle school campus, the, replacing the um, bleachers, press box, adding in a uh, trail park center, uh, relocating the early uh, childhood playground over closer towards what you see is here is a hip building over here, which is concession stand. The existing concession stand will then be turned into storage and uh, future use for the the teams, part of pushing this program out, you can actually see, is we're actually completing an uh, extension to the parking lot, since many had said that the parking was in dire need, and getting another possible entrance into the main campus. What we're doing is trying to culminate a uh, population from the street, in from the tunnel from the high school and trying to create a small oculus. You can see in the round corner there. 
and a better way into the main um, football <coughs> the sitting area, flag, concession stand that falls in the distance. Creating a better curb appeal, placing the fencing, creating uh, potentially some nicer graphics along the fence line and signage to help link all three buildings together. Now, in terms of behind the high school, we're upgrading the uh, main field for baseball, making it large enough so that when we turf it, we can actually use the outfield as a potential practice field, while still keeping two other grass practice fields, regrading the potholes and divots, and making those playable, and then creating a lit field, turf field, in towards the street. To get that to fit, we are pushing in a little bit on uh, RCK's parking lot and entrance, and reconfiguring that as far as the works go. I'm going to quickly fly through just to give an overview of the high school. Um, baseball, you can see the dugouts, bleachers behind, and a potential uh, practice field in the outfield there. Samples of what we have done at AH2M, just to, since we can't design everything in before the farm, showing you samples of what we have done for other school districts. This one is in Terrytown. We actually did turf field there, where you can see multiple games are all lined separately and are uh, taken into account there. We've also done Carl Place all the time upgrades. We are actually planning at the high school to upgrade the sound system, theater lighting, and some of the uh, interior finishes in which to make it a brighter uh, room after the uh, Energy Poland's contract comes in and places the lighting. We are giving you just a sample of what the secured entry vestibule looks like, creating man, what they call man traps. It just looks like a vestibule and that's what we want it to try to be like. But what the most important part is that they have a secure point where visitors at all hours come in, they get uh, their IDs checked, they're contained in that vestibule and only get buzzed in after their after their scan brought in. Typical uh, cafeteria upgrade that we've done these days at Massapequa, where we created soft seating, different kinds of seating, created a small little senior center behind the glazed wall, TVs, different finishes can help improve Kitchen server upgrades. Uh, we are anticipating renovating the kitchen servery at the high school. Just thought we'd like to share some photos that we've done in the past. Uh, South Huntington entry lobbies is part of the high school, and by doing some of the security entry vestibules, we're upgrading the lobbies. We have a new, unique way to try to. Gain uh, more curb appeal, more entry, brighter areas, uh, more areas for students to come and study, um, stay, and utilize this more of a facility for a longer period of time. Locker rooms will be upgraded, just a sample there, and um, not the, last but not least, an image of a sample STEM classroom that we've done in the Malvern where we are actually uh, creating multiple zones in the classroom where they've got labs as well as specific student teaching areas. They have areas specifically breakout spaces for projects and creating interactive display areas. I'm sorry, this is probably a whole bunch of information, but uh, that's the overview of that. Anyone have any questions? Yes. Uh, are you going to be doing any LED lighting upgrades or solar panels, any type of energy efficiency? Not at this point, but you actually have an energy performance contract that's currently doing that now. They're replacing the light fixtures actually here as well. Um, 
where they're turning all the light fixtures into LED, they're doing uh, HVAC upgrades, thermostat repairs, replacements, and uh, solar panels on the back So the solar panels may be going up after the roof, possibly? Possibly. We're working with them now to try to integrate Let those the areas. You do have the roof at Connecticut that is being replaced now, but that's the first school that's going to then have solar panels. So you have a new roof, so you get a warranty with the roof. Now you're going to bring in solar panels, somebody's going to pump that. Who's responsible for fixing it? Mo mainly, most of these systems are actually floating on top. They're actually ballasted systems. They're sitting on insulation. They're weighted down, and they're sitting on top of it. Most of the penetrations are all sealed through that contract that we installed. So if there's a leak towards that area, they're going to be bringing in uh, roofers that have been certified by the existing roofing companies and they will make sure that that work gets flashed and properly treated. Okay. Yes, let's do that. I have the questions. Okay. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. In no particular order. Have there been any provisions made for the removal of any asbestos containing material found during construction if the bond passed? Uh, yes, there has been. There are contingencies included into the budget lines for asbestos containing materials. I will add on to that. There's contingent money on top of. But we, all right, it's part of it. 59 million is actually uh, hard and soft costs. We were recommending to the board that they also hire, as part of this work scope, uh, a construction manager, which will help come in and organize uh, construction activities, scheduling of all the work that's being done, their fees, our fees, uh, printing reimbursable costs are all included into this larger 60 million, roughly 60 million dollar number. Will as there well be a, as, uh, uh, sorry, uh, that's right. will there be a standard escalation and other contingencies as well? Will there be a, will there be bathrooms by the new uh, by the uh, track and the uh, field? We're actually um, building a concession stand at the main track. Hopefully, um, as part of um, as part of the entry, you'll be passing by the concession stand that will also include toilets as well, used for the public. Is there a guarantee, do we have to guarantee that the money that is being used for each project will be used for that project? The way the bond is being written, um, what they typically would like to do is, if a project does get smaller, that that money then gets put back into the district's hands and can be then decided by the district what to do beyond that point. Say if you're roofing, we budgeted the number out of the areas, I don't have my numbers, specific numbers with me, 12 million, and it comes in at 10 million. At that point, the 2 million can then be reappropriated into the uh, district's hands and they can distribute that. Or not borrow. And vote on that um, and where to distribute that money. Or not borrow, right? Or not borrow. Yeah, that's the other component. Thank you. And just can I please tell me, I don't want to have my phone. So uh, let's say the project does come in at 55 million. <laughs> The total construction. Right, total. So let's say the total. Over um, multiple contracts. Yes, over multiple contracts. So <laughs> let's say the project is underspent. Without another voter approval, the district cannot spend that money on anything except what you've already approved. Mm -hmm. So um, part of the financing plan is issuing those one year bond anticipation notes. So that gives the district flexibility. Let's say it does come in at 55 million. You won't have to borrow long term on 1259 to 57. Um, you only borrow what's actually being spent on the project. So that would result in lower, excuse me, lower debt service payments, more than likely lower building payments too because your expenses are not high, but just to give you an idea. They can't put it into, the district can't put it into operating and use the difference in operating. All right, I think we're gonna ask yes, Mr. Harrison to answer the next question. Not to put you on the spot, but we have a multi-tiered okay. no. multi question for Mr. Harrison. Uh -oh. First, can you explain the capital reserve fund that was established in May 2006? 
going to step up. What, what year was it? Uh, still? Just want to check. 2016. Thank you. So we established a capital reserve by approval of the voters that we put up to $2 million of surplus into a capital reserve for a period of 10 years, not to exceed $20 million. And, if we, and when we want to spend that money as we're anticipating doing now, we have to go out to the public in a vote to get approval to spend the money. Another question? I actually have three more. Wow. How much is in this fund and where does the money come from? Okay, any money that's in the reserve fund, you can talk generally about it, comes from a, a surplus, which means you've had revenues exceeding your expenses, which creates a surplus, and there are different buckets that the district can put money into, and that's, uh, that's, where the, that's what we do with the surplus at the end of the school year. What was the second part of the no, that was, that was the whole question. How much, you know, how, how, oh, how much was in it? Okay, the capital reserve has a uh, balance of $2 million from last year's uh, surplus, now which I is being voted on this May. I think you answered this one. Will this fund be used for, for this project, for the capital improvement project? Yes, part of the uh, proposition is to use $2 million to offset the $59 million, so we're not spending, we're not borrowing the full $59 million. And what is the difference between a capital reserve fund and a surplus? Well, the surplus is what is used to fund a uh, capital reserve. And if you have left over at the end of the year? Yes. Okay, thank you. But part of that process would be a uh, $2 million uh, capital reserve fund. Uh, the numbers that Maureen Crowley was, uh, Christian Crowley was, uh, that's the full six to five fifty nine point nine million. If you're now reducing it down to the fifty seven point nine million, you're actually borrowing less. That numbers that she was looking at and projecting out are actually going to get lower. Your tax increase or your tax neutral will actually be getting lower, thereby getting more money back at the end of each year. So that's why they're like, the board is saying to utilize that money now so we don't have if you, if you have a cash in the reserve and that's the purpose of that reserve, which is for capital improvement, it's prudent to use those funds on a capital project so that you're not paying long term interest on the $2 million that's sitting in the account. If there was a slot where you could make a lot more interest in the investment than on the lottery, then maybe we would say that. <laughs> so each year we can take a surplus and put it toward this um, project? Like that? Uh, no. Well, you, you could. Technically, you could do that if we weren't in long-term financing. But, um, you know, there's a long, and I don't get too much into it, but there, there's a long list of um, priorities that the district goes through in very um, um, strong management and making sure that where they're putting the surplus funds are appropriate for the district's long-term financial goals. So, technically, you could, but I'm not saying that they go every single year. Does this year's budget include any surplus at all? Or does it go directly towards um, the bond? So what you budgeted for about for this year's budget is there going to be a surplus at going back into the capital reserve? Uh, there is anticipation of a surplus this school year. Uh, the board, as well as administration, has yet to make a decision on where those monies are going. But capital reserve is under consideration. Question. What if the uh, project overruns? Well, how does that work? Well, it won't. <laughs> but uh, we are doing this in phases. So, Wait, time uh, out a minute. We have the next question is phases. So, this, this, we're going kind to of, kind of, let's, let's kind of finish up with the questions and then we can open the floor to finish up. Um, it says here, what is the difference between the two phases and why do we have a 10 million first phase? Can I answer that, that, that part? Thank you. Um, so the finance. So when I developed the financing plan, I talked about all those resources that we were looking at using, and one of them is certainly the retiring debt. So when I built that, I was able to put the debt service in for 10. 10.9 phase, whichever the first one is, um, without having any kind of tax increases. 
a year or so earlier than the larger piece. So that's where it comes into. It comes into the financing plan to make sure that we can make everything level moving forward. And as we go into the second phase, I don't anticipate uh, $49 million worth of work going on the street all at one time. So as we go through the projects, we'll be able to see how we're dealing with the overall uh, budget for the project. Uh, we're not authorized to spend more than uh, what's authorized by the voters. So if we find ourselves in that situation, uh, we'd have to talk and decide what the next approach would be. Well, work may not get done, or we may have to go back after the voters. There's a second part on that card, but it, it's, it's a duplicate, so I'm going to read that one at the end. So I didn't want anybody, whoever wrote the card, I didn't want to think you left it out. Um, the next question. And I received an EI tax pack letter in the mail today. It says that previous bond issues raised taxes even though it was promoted as being tax neutral. What is your response to that claim? Um, I think I'll take that one. Please. Um, you know, the state, we, we, we're very quick to criticize. But, as I said before, there is a system out there where if you don't burden yourself with multiple layers of debt, and you do this every 15 years, you should be okay. None of us were here for that 15 years ago in decision-making positions. One of the things we're, we're um, adamant about is that we're going to archive something for the next generation. Because um, this question rolls into sort of the what, what's culminating, looks like it's going to be the wrap-up. Um, you know, we have, we have agonized. We, we, they, we had a list of $78 million worth of work but we knew the $60 million number was the magic number from uh, Mrs. Crowley. And, uh, you know, we hesitate to talk about a surplus because we are also protecting ourselves, insulating ourselves from the volatility of the stock market, healthcare costs, and, um, uh, um, help me out, Steve. Contractual obligations. Contractual obligations. Um, we, and also the rules have changed, the way the state does this. You know, we're still closing the books out on the old bond. We're hoping to have this, you know, the majority of this work done in three years. Um, and we, you know, the state has changed the way they give you the aid. The work has to be done, it has to be signed off by the architects, um, by the district. So, you know, I, I don't want to sound flip here, but we're committed to bringing this project not only in you know, we're committed to bringing in under budget. And the way that's going to be, and I'm going to roll into the next questions, um, how can you be sure the project will be done properly in a timely fashion? We're currently interviewing um, project managers who are essentially our internal affairs. Their, their job is to go around and their job is to make sure that the jobs are done. Um, you know, the bond, is, you know, the bond is out there, it's online. Um, these are the men and women who go out into the field who make sure that the contractors are doing their jobs. And honestly, uh, you know, people don't get paid till, till we feel the work is done. And, you know, uh, it, you know, for us, it would be less work to do this, but it wouldn't be as exciting and as challenging. So, um, so I add to that, part of the contracts are also put into checks and balances. So what the construction managers are doing is making sure that those checks and balances get done and in the end, it's our professional licenses, as Mr. Dolan said, we're signing and sealing those documents saying that's complete and per the contract that has been set up and approved by the school district. So all of that's going to be then reviewed with the school district, mapped out, made forward, and the maximum amount of warranties uh, and guarantees are going to be And I think that these two sort of go together, so I'm going to read them together. On the major issues inside our buildings going to be addressed first, roof, electric, plumbing. Will you start with the buildings or will it be like exterior fields? Um, the state has to approve all these projects in order for us to be eligible for aid. Um, things like plumbing and electrical, interior work takes longer to get approval. And this is something that, you know, it hasn't come up. We could very easily not mention it and just move on, but I'm going to address it. The thing that hasn't come up here is security. I know we're going to be doing the man traps, but we also have an extensive plan to, to 
for the interior uh, our cameras and swipe cards and security. I applaud the board for the following thing. You know, we, we could have put a lot of this into this bond and said to the public, hey, if the bond fails, um, you're not going to get your security. Um, we, we, there's a smart bond out there that's used for technology. And you can use it for technology and security. And the state is promising to speed up the approval there. So we have, um, we're about to in, unveil in the next couple of weeks our proposal that's going to go to the state for extensive security measures. And, and this way, it's going to take a little bit longer to implement because we need state approval, but security is coming first. First and foremost, security. If the man traps are in the bond, if the bond goes down, we're going to have to reposition money in the budget because we're going to have to get the man traps. But security is going to come first. And I think what, what the plan is, um, there'll be a combination. If the bond passes, uh, probably before the fall, correct me if I'm wrong, Robert, what you'll see is, uh, we may get some roof work, we'll get the man trap started, and we'll get a little field work done, started. And that way people will begin to see it. The interior work, the, cafe the uh, music suite, the cafeteria, the bathrooms, that's going to take longer to get state approval. Um, and then we'll work with our project manager and the architects to schedule that. The other thing we're going to tell you, um, number one about the fields, they're all going to be lined for multi-purpose. It's not going to be a football field. You're going to have lacrosse, you're going to have soccer, you're going to have field hockey, everything. All, all the fields will be lined multiple ways for multiple uses. Um, the, the little leagues and stuff will have access. The vision and the dream, if we fix up the music and the, and the auditorium and we fix up our fields, we can have summer camps here also. Um, we want this to be a hub. We want this to be a showcase. We've already told the Chamber of Commerce that they pay taxes, the businesses pay taxes. We will have along our fencing. Now, shop locally. We're not going to charge them every year. We're going to pick a nice little sign. Nice. If they buy it, we can't buy it for them. We put it up. It stays there as long as you're in business um, to encourage people to shop locally. We, we want the school to be the center. We want your kids here, you know, 12 months out of the year. We want to do good, productive things. Um, and again, as I said, we want, we want, I'm not getting any younger. I would love to enjoy it looking very nice for my last couple of years here. So we're, we're, the, the work will start, um, Robert, correct me if I'm wrong, 20 to 24 weeks from, from when the bond passes. Correct. And what we'll do is, and, and had this experience, uh, we've had this experience before, I've seen it, some school districts say, no, you have to work in the summer and only in the summer. You pay top dollar and you're at the mercy of the crew, you, you don't get the best crews because these construction companies want to keep their best workers as, you know, year round if they can. You can do field work in the fall, you can do field work in the early spring, you can do bathrooms at night, okay? You can, you can, you know, listen, the music wing is gonna be a little bit different, the auditorium's gonna be a little bit different because you, you can't just rip them apart, okay? Um, but wherever we can do stuff on, on second shift, we're doing a lot of second shift work with our lighting now because we have custodians at night. Um, roof work, we're very, we're very happy with the fact that the ConnectQuad roof is going on they actually started it in February. Never thought that would be possible. They came, the team came to me early, um, you know, Mr. Harrison, Mr. Manzo, Mr. Wolhoff, and they said, we think we can do work in February. I said, you can't do a roof in February. It's too cold. Now remember how nice it was in February, how miserable it was in March. February break, um, they came, they did the work. Um, they, they said they were gonna do a portion. They looked at the weather, they scaled it back. Um, and then they, they kicked themselves because the weather actually was better than they thought. They could have done a little more. Better safe than sorry. They worked over the April break. The, the neighbors came over after with Easter leftovers to give the workers because they were very happy that the workers were on the roof doing work and they didn't make a lot of noise. So the message is we're going to do the work in a timely fashion and we're going to do it, at, we're going to work with the construction people to get the, you can actually get the best teams on off season and save some money. So we're gonna be as creative as we can, um, which leads me to the last question, which is a very difficult one for me to answer. It says, do all the board members agree with and, and support this proposal? Um, it's public, the, the board voted four to one. It's public record. But one of the things that, that we're adamant about is, all the board members um, want the best for this district. Do they always agree? No. If they all agreed all the time, um, 
you know, it would be an artificial situation. They, they, they represent different segments of the community. I think that there is a board member for each, for every personality in this district. Um, you know, the, the, the board has had some very interesting discussions, some heated discussions, some passionate discussions. Um, you know, th this, we now need to hear from the people. There is something for everybody in this bond. As I said before, the millennials are gonna hit Google Earth and look at a picture of our property before they come here to buy a house. Um, and, you know, I've been doing the tours. I've told these stories so many times. I feel badly some of the people have heard them multiple times. But I, I had the one. I'll tell one. The gentleman who whose three kids graduated in the 70s, and uh, I had him pegged as a uh, as someone. He's my father's age because my brothers and I graduated at the same time. I had him pegged as someone who was never going to support anything like this. But I we've saddled through, and he he at the end of the tour, and I, I'll admit it. I was, I was a little tired, a little cranky, and I thought to myself, when he starts ripping into me, I'm either going to punch him in the head or start crying, and neither one is really appropriate or, or pretty. I said at the end of the tour, any questions? And this gentleman said, Mr. Dolan, which always makes me chuckle. The guy's my dad's age, and he calls me Mr. Dolan, but he said, you know, my kids graduated a long time ago. I haven't been in these schools in a long time. When my kids went here, it was brand new, and somebody must have paid for that. He goes, you know, I'm going to have to think about this. Because if somebody's going to want to buy my house, they're going to need a reason to buy my house. It's the circle of life. It is the Lion King. It's, 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 it's a generational thing. And I think the message is, say what you want about East Islip. It's a roll up your sleeves, hard work in town. Sometimes, sometimes it gets a little rough, but every, you know, there's a tremendous amount of passion and people care. If we learned a lesson by not doing anything for the last 15 years, we did the right thing by not doing anything. And if we make good decisions now, we can leave a note to the next generation and say, and as you saw, I think Christine showed you, you know, the, 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 the uh, local share of the tax levy in 2034 is going to be roughly the same as it is today. So we're saying to the next generation, hey guys, we did the best we could. You got new roofs. You got, you know, we, we took care of the roofs. We took care of the bathrooms. We took care of your fields. Uh, we took care of your parking lots. I'm leaving some, we took care of your electric. You're really not going to have to do those things. We did that. Now it's up to you. And, and so, does anybody else have any questions? Yes. The next bond, can you report air conditioning? Me? That I'm just thinking, you th if you think I'm still going to be alive for the next bond, I'm just flattered. But yes. yes, absolutely. The now, wonder, are there any schools with air conditioning? Well, portions of the schools currently are in air conditioning, but yeah. many of the classrooms are not. Yeah. Um, you can't currently convert and put in air conditioning until you deal with the electrical upgrades first. And, and as far as the There were conversations on trying to include that into this bond, but through the facility uh, meetings that we've had and with conversations with the board, the priority was to try to get the areas that were a little bit bigger ticket items, like fixing the roof above our, the heads of the school kids fixing the doors and making them more secure, et cetera. So, I know it was a consideration. I know they were up for the summer, but like last year, my daughter was coming home with a headache like yeah. three times a week, just the last few weeks. I know, I understand it's only a few weeks out of the year that they really need it. But uh, even sometimes when we're in these big rooms and they're full of people, like when this room is full of people, it gets hot. Well, and it would be nice to have it. One of the things that we're looking at, and we're also hoping with technology, um, we're in the energy performance contract. Um, we are lowering our electric draw because of light bulbs and such. We will, you know, shortly we will be rolling out, you know, in the near future, a, a new solar plan to help pay for it. Um, we have the wall units. And right now, um, central air conditioning is absolutely cost prohibitive. Oh, yeah. But now there are things, that, and the way it was described to me, I think it was Robert and Severio, um, his partner, um, when you go down to the tropics, if you've ever been to like Florida and the hotels, those split systems, there, there, are, there are going to be options. Now look, we already said that there's $78 million in need, and I think that Central Air would be about $20 million on top of that. We need, we need furniture in the classrooms, we need technology for the kids. You know, we need, we need student-driven, you know, teacher-supported technology. We have some tough decisions still to make. That's why I hesitate to say, yes, on paper, um, Mr. Harrison knows we have a surplus, but we still have needs that exceed our 
our dollar amounts. But I think that's something that we're going to be looking at closely over the next couple of years because, you know, again, I, I, my gut right now, if you go into New York City and you see a school, every, every school has an individual air conditioner. Aesthetically, it's not what you want. It's not pretty. <coughs> but we will address, and, we, and we're also going to be careful because we, we'll watch climate, but the need for air conditioners in a school is approximately 15% of the time. So we're not going to spend $25 million on it yet, but it is something, and that's going to be something that we hand off and the next generation is going to wrestle with, no yeah. doubt about it. With the electrical upgrades that we do have currently planned for the budget, and the EPC lowering the electrical need for the buildings there are, but has some capacity still left over, that you can start phasing in certain areas of that over time without I think it will definitely enhance the school system as far as resale, home prices, and things like that. Uh, at least in my opinion. What happens if it doesn't pass? Is there any improvements? Um, we, we're going we're gonna to we're have to retool a little bit. We, we, we don't have much choice. Um, it, it, you, what you'll see is, is a pretty mediocre product. And mediocre, mediocrity lasts forever, so um, there's, there's really not a lot to take out. And, and, and one of the things we've heard about pay as you go, pay as you go, I mean, it, the problem is this, and correct me if I'm wrong, Christine, a bond like this is a fixed rate mortgage. It locks in your payment, so you know what to expect. I mean, I'd hate to be the guy that had to decide, okay, we're going to do one roof a year for the next six years. Who goes first, who goes last, knowing full well that each year those roofs are getting, you know, this is a way to meet the needs of the district across the board. If I can just add to that, uh, you have a balancing effect when you do things as we're planning with your expenditures match with your revenues. If you pay as you go, your expenditures are in year one, but your revenue to back up those expenditures are over a 15 year period. And, it's, and, I'll, and I'll repeat it again, as much as we get frustrated with the state of New York, you know, remember, it's almost like the, the state of New York has 700 children, all vying. I mean, listen, if we could go bankrupt and have the state come in and pick up the tab, I'd be the first guy to say, let's go bankrupt, okay? The state does not, the state wants you to maintain your facilities. And, and they did something, Lenny brought something up before, they, they upped the aid in, in 2000, when they knew the population was going down, they said add on, even though we knew the population was going down. Um, you know, we're looking closely, just, just chaired the Long Range Planning Committee. We're, we are really trying to, uh, you know, look long range. We're proud of the fact, we, you know, we sat and talked when Jess first was on the board, my first year, the board were in the room, uh, Billy, uh, you know, Phil and, and Jeff and Jeff and Chris and uh, Steve Behan, and we, we were throwing numbers around, and we, we kind of felt like, we could raise taxes 2.25 over three years, and we were wrong. It was 1.31, and we have a surplus, and we think we have a fiscally responsible bond. That's it's not going to take care of all our needs. And you're right, air conditioning is going to be something that we're going to have to talk about. But uh, it's, it's nothing compared to the roofs and all the other. And well, just remember, the next generation. If if the climate does get worse, you know, the windows and air conditioning next bond. And then the bond after that, you can do the roofs again. We're, we're trying to put together, really, a long-range plan. And I just hope I live to see a couple more roofs on these buildings. You touched on furniture, <clears throat> the desks. Uh, is that going to be, is that part of this? No, that's not. That's new, my kids come home and see the rock and it's dangerous. It's well, like it's twofold, the furniture. Um, and we're looking at that as a, a three-year program, three, maybe three to five. Um, research shows, listen, kids come to school, they don't need answers anymore because they can ask Siri, but we need to teach them how to work together and create a synergy. So the newest, the latest and greatest is, you know, desks that move together easily and um, our, our, our desks are ancient and they're not comfortable. And I'm not talking about cushions, I'm just talking about, you know, to the body. Um, we're, we're buying a little bit of furniture this year, we're, we're setting up in the steam rooms in each building and at the high school, the computer lab to sort of test run what works, what doesn't work. But that's, you know, you're not gonna reshape the classrooms. Those cinder block walls, it would, you, you can't tear them down, it costs too much money. 
But the two, the two burning questions, uh, learning furniture and learning technology, how much do we need per student over the next couple of years to meet their needs? Um, you know, so we are trying to, and the board is adamant about this, think forward thinking, forward thinking, and um, budgeting not just year to year. And if you have a little surplus, like I said, uh, I hope this doesn't happen, but if we have a terrible year next year economically, we're not going to have to dismantle the things that we've started. And that's really thanks to the board and Steve and Paul and their forward thinking. I, I show one of the pictures, they would show the lights on the football field and one of the models. No, but I'll, I'll answer that right now. There's no lights on the football. The football field won't have lights. The field behind the high school over by Spur, which we have no, we're trying to, you know, we're trying to be good to our neighbors. Okay, we've made some mistakes. I know that. Um, but uh, uh, the other thing is, this, you know, the, in addition to letting the little leagues and the little, we want the young kids up here either in our auditorium in our music room in the summer, on our fields, because if they see it, they're going to want to go to school here and not go, you know, not go to other places. Um, but also, um, you know, it, it's tough for parents to get home at four o'clock to see a soccer game or a lacrosse game. Football on Saturday afternoon, everybody's home. That's the only reason they get the big crowd. Um, but what, what we're hoping to do is be able to put out, you know, our lacrosse, soccer, field hockey, play those games at six o'clock, so that the parents can be home for those games. And um, also, um, the, the th one of the things that people don't realize is the increased activity by the kids in physical education classes when you have, you know, you know uh, fields. It's, you know, I've seen it twice. I've moved twice in my career, and, and I've seen them put in, and, you know, you just get more participation. So, so be, uh, which field is going to have lights? The one on Spur, it'll be against Spur Drive. Not around the track. Maybe. Not around the track. Oh, the one behind, oh, I'm sorry, the one behind the high school Spur Drive over there. So which the will be... The football field is here, over on the side behind the middle school. That is only getting the lights around the track. The low level lights, so people can use it, the track, to walk, mm -hmm. exercise, etc. To come in and out along the road, along the river. The main... There's two things with that. Currently now you have cars coming. It's, it's fun to watch in the morning when parents are trying to drop off the kids at the early childhood and, and they're in a rush and the cars are going in and out. But also, um, our handicap accessibility to the track is Roslyn Road, which I don't know if you've been on Roslyn Road. It's bumpy. It, it's, and, and again, we want to close Roslyn Road. We're not going to use Roslyn Road anymore. And this way we would have handicap accessibility um, because right now we actually have a, 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 one of our a local, a local gentlemen who volunteers and helps with the track program is a, a paraplegic, a, a quadriplegic, I'm sorry, in a wheelchair. And it's a, it's a he, he's a wonderful man, he's very patient. And it, it, it's, it, it's a monumental effort to get it in there. And, and it's, it's not just for him, but we want, I, I cringe sometimes when you see what we try to do on Roslyn Road. And if we can just close that Roslyn Road gate and and have nice access and better traffic flow. The, the idea and overall concept of this is, is talking about is to try to keep your access there 
and then bring people in through the ramp and have them down here to make track over there. So you'll then have, um, you'll let, as Joel said, you're closing this access off, relieving there for emergency vehicles, obviously only, and then trying to get everybody uh, in with more of a formal entrance down on the north side. Robert, the if you could go back to the last slide. I don't know, did you discuss the little walkway that's below the... the um, I was trying to go back. <laughs> well, no, but very quickly, yeah, sure, quickly the maybe. proposal is to have an adult... It's a, it's a little bit of an adult fitness center next to the playground so that adults can come up. And we, we really would love this to be, you know, a centerpiece where on a weekend you'd have a playground for kids, you'd have a little trail for the adults. Um, we, we did get a small grant from one of the uh, companies, um, and, it, and, and that's tentatively in the plans to have something uh, for the community to come up here and use this. Okay. Yeah, the intent is to try to create more of a presentable front to your fields now, give it some street uh, presence, and trying to link that. We're seeing it going on for so. Okay. Uh, creating more of a Street front entrance and sort of saying, hey, that we're at, instead of seeing it off in the distance, bring people in and through, uh, and then eventually down into more of a focal point and that then people can come in onto the track angle or uh, bleachers. Just making it easier access, more accessible for uh, people with handicap, uh, improving the landscaping around. And you know these are just open views from the end of the parking lot, but you can see here straight access in from behind the ECC straight into the bleacher area. Series of steps down the stairs. We're trying to get more people to use, and since it's spending money to improve them, make them more accessible. I'm sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. Last question. Sure. I'm only bringing this up because I've heard a number of people talk about it, and I don't know if anyone's asked it yet. While we talk about integrating the community, a lot of people have been saying our local contractor is going to be able to bid on any of these jobs if they're qualified. You know, if they're a big commercial electric company or a parking lot paver or so a landscaper that has the credentials, you know, they're bonded, insured, and they're able to do this type of job? Or is it just strictly whatever the architects and... Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, basically, we're presenting everything as an open bid. Anything we do with the state, we have to get, uh, it's all published. Anyone who's an open bid can come in. The drawings and specs will be all online. They can be downloaded. They present their credentials, the correct bonding uh, for the right price. We review it along with the construction managers as well as the school district. We we'll all review the packages together and then move forward. If the local firm is uh, properly funded, bonded, can do the work, they've got the history of doing the work, fantastic. <laughs> Great. They're probably going to be less, they're going to be right there, they're going to give more immediate need, uh, better response time, they're better invested, why not use them? If they are qualified, and that's what we have to make sure that as part of our specifications, along with the drawings that are out there, uh, to find out. Excellent. I think... Uh... This is the point where we say thank you all very much, and, and we encourage you, please, please, reach out to your neighbors. Um, we know that people are going on the website because we keep track of it, um, but wouldn't it be nice, Korea's going to kill me, you know, but if we had 10,000 people vote now. Um, <laughs> no, but it, it, I told him he has to help me. <laughs> you'd be better off if I stayed upstairs and got somebody else to help you. Um, but in all seriousness, the response that we've heard from the people that have come and, and seen it, you know, uh, has been very, very, um, I think, thoughtful. I think it's the way to go. We don't, we're not asking anybody how they're going to vote, 
but don't shy away. You know, the Navy you may not have spoken to, or, um, you know, the board did a pretty bold thing. It's not easy to do a budget and a bond together. If, if you ask me again, if, if, I'd tell the next guys, do it in July, because when you have the bond and the budget together, your eyeballs start to cross over the numbers sometimes. But, you know, thanks to Steve and, and, and the board, we double check, we double check, we triple check. But in all seriousness, um, please, don't, don't not say something to someone because you're afraid they might not vote the way you're going to vote. It's really important to say to people, hey, come on. And for those people that are not computer savvy and may not want to come up for a tour, you know, if you invite them in or you go into their house and turn on the computer and just show them, you know, that's the, you know, we, we, we say this to the kids all the time, study hard, read and make good choices on your tests and in life. And, uh, um, you know, what we're asking everybody to do here is do a little studying, read, and, and make a good choice. Don't pull that lever unless you've really, really looked at what's out there and, you know, what, what we have. And with that, I'm going to say very... You've got to call it a circle, don't you pull it a lever. what? You've got to call it a circle. It's a test. Holy cow, you're kind of wild. <laughs> Mr. Jones, before, if I can interrupt, the, the photos are, our presentations are online. So Everything's online. If they can not come out, obviously, they can, you can certainly point them online to the PDFs that we have here. And, and it gives me um, always great pleasure to, how about we give Michael Solomon another nice round of applause. Thank you, Michael. Michael. You know, Michael's graduating, he's going to five towns, he's going to study film, he, he, his favorite genre is... Um, his horror movies, because he likes to give people a little release. But we asked him what he's going to be doing this summer. He's going to be filming, directing movies, as well as well as creating scripts for future short films for college. My God, Michael, I'm glad you don't want to be the superintendent. You're a lot more ambitious than I am. But uh, thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Guys, have a good night.